Hey everybody, welcome to this week's response video. We are on the road cruising California, making some stops, checking out some spots, and uh, you know, just trying to stay busy with the uh, old winter winner over here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, congrats to Turk getting third place last weekend, Long Beach. It was. Uh, it's killer watching you go out there in that Thanks, uh, you know, rebuilt FRS. Looks like it's really working. It's doing something. Yeah. <laughs> sure doing some is. drifting. It's doing something, that's for sure. All right. All right. We're going to show up. you guys some action, but we're going to do some questions first. So first question to Forsberg. All right. From Jonathan Fangrad. Do the external wastegates you installed link back to the exhaust, or do they have screamer pipes? Two-part mm, question. Two-part. Um, if so, are the oh. screamer parts legal for a streetcar? Um, well... The car that we used for the Drift Garage build, we actually did do screamer pipes. You know, right. They're loud, they're awesome. It's uh, definitely a fun way to do it, but you know, this car will be used primarily for the track. Uh, screamer pipes are illegal for street purpose. And uh, you know, for those that don't know what that is, that means the excess exhaust that gets diverted around the turbo to control the boost levels actually just gets dumped either around the turbo back into the exhaust the legal way before the cat or it will be dumped straight to the ground, which is just a little more responsive and um, it makes also it a lot more, a lot louder. Makes it Hence louder the screamer too. pipe. Makes it sound and good. And it sounds badass. Yeah. All right, Forsberg, next question is from MX5 Cinematography. All right. He asks, when doing custom fab parts, do you guys keep plans to make the same part again, or is it different every time? Hmm. Well, I guess it depends on the actual part that we're making. If we're doing like a oil catch can or something like that, we just make it one-off to fit the vehicle each time. But if we're doing custom parts like control arms, something that's a little more expendable, and we definitely need a lot of spares of, then yes, we do make a lot of jigs. Uh, we even do jigs for motor mounts anytime we're doing like a crazy motor swap. You know, it just uh, saves us some time and energy for the next time around. In the end, yeah. given that potential issue. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah, always, always good to have spare parts. That's right. Hello, this is Jason from Engineering Explained, and my question is for Ryan. Now, I get a lot of people asking me about tuning, uh, and a lot of questions around the topic of tuning, and although I take that to be a very general term, a lot of people have a very specific meaning, it seems, in their heads about what it means. Regardless, a lot of people will say, you know, even after simple modifications, the reason why you didn't see any benefit was because you didn't tune the vehicle. After what modifications do you want to make sure that you actually tune the engine? Um, because it seems like the ECU would be able to compensate for minor changes. Uh, and what exactly are you changing, whether that's air fuel ratio or ignition timing, things like that. Uh, so as specific as you can be about tuning and when it's necessary and after what modifications. Thanks. Tuning is basically just making adjustments, uh, whether it's in the ECU, uh, with wrenches on your suspension, or clicker adjustments on the shocks. Uh, tuning is just uh, making adjustments to the car. So uh, for, for engine parts, really, you want to have uh, ECU tuning done when you change a camshaft, or you uh, go bigger fuel injector, injectors, you change your mass airflow sensor, convert it to a map, um, anything like that, or you turn the boost up on your turbo or change a turbocharger altogether, your tuning is what's really going to get the most amount of power for that application uh, for the money that you spent on those upgrades. So um, if you're spending money on these parts, these, these engine parts that are supposed to be power adders, and then you're skipping on either the ECU, the engine management system, and the tuning, then you're really just throwing your money out the out the door. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You have to have you have to have everything set and done so that you can uh, you, you can have the benefits of what you're spending your money on with the uh, engine parts. So I would say uh, specifically for tuning in general, that's it's more of a tuner question. But generally, what they do uh, is uh, dial in the fuel map for proper air fuel ratios and ignition timing to be able to uh, make sure things are safe and making the proper power. And you're going to go out in a track and not blow the thing up or melt the pistons down because of you know, a lean environment or too much timing or too little timing. Everything has a perfect balance. 
You just gotta make sure that you're gonna be taking your car to the proper tuner and or engine builder or, or so on and so forth. Somebody that actually knows what they're doing and has a, a good reputation of, uh, of doing that kind of work. But tuning can be done pretty much to anything, whether it's musical instruments or, uh, or suspension on a car or like I said, the, uh, the engine package. So uh, with that being said, uh, make sure you go to a reputable person and get your tuning done uh, by somebody that you know is good and, uh, and make your stuff last on the track. All right, next question is from Sean Callahan. Mm -hmm. Pretty good question. All right. I mean, this is uh, something that could definitely be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Is a thermostat necessary for the oil cooler setup? Oh, that is a good one. Well, thermostat is not necessary for an oil cooler setup. There are lots of guys that run without you know, a thermostat setup. Uh, Mishimoto offers it both ways, uh, with or without the thermostat. But um, for a street car, I'd say it's definitely helpful it uh, gets your oil temps up to temp quicker. On a track car, some people might see it as a restriction or a possible you know, failure link. So there's more time to just like fire up the car and warm up in the pits before we hit the track. So it's uh, just something that's not as necessary for a car specifically built to you know, just get ripped on all day long. But uh, for a street car, yeah, definitely helpful. I agree. Also in the colder temperatures and stuff, it's, uh, it's nice to have a thermostat if you're dry, actually driving your car with an oil cooler set up in the winter time. That always causes a potential problem to uh, get the engine temps up to up to par. Definitely true. It keeps them more regulated. Mm -hmm. Greetings, Chris. Eric, the car guy here. I got a question for you. What are the differences between your car and a stock 370Z? Well, it looks like we have a special guest this week, and thanks for tuning in, Eric. So, to answer your question, the differences between a stock 370Z and our Formula Drift prepared 370Z would be a lot less than you would think. Actually, our Formula Drift car resembles a 370Z through the chassis and through the subframes and all the suspension geometry. The biggest differences would be is that we removed the factory V6 and installed the Nissan Titan V8 engine. We build that thing all the way out, add nitrous, and we're now making a thousand horsepower with it. But as far as the actual chassis, the Formula D rules do not allow us to hack up the chassis too much. We can't tube frame it. We can't throw away the suspension and put whatever we want underneath that car. We do use the factory 370 subframes, all the arms and links, and actually even the hubs. We do modify the front spindles with the use of Voodoo 13 products to make extra steering angle in the front end. And that accompanied with a full drive train replacement to go with that 1000 horsepower V8. We do a NASCAR style four speed dog box with a Winters quick change rear end to replace the factory Nissan dip. That allows us to put all that power to the ground without breaking those factory components. As far as the exterior styling, we use Savon carbon fiber parts to replace all the factory panels. The car still very much resembles a 370Z, and what we do is replace those panels with those lightweight carbon pieces to get the weight down as much as possible. All right, well that about does it for our response video for episode two of Drift Garage season two. Thank you for watching, and as we always say, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below, and we will pick out the good ones and throw some answers out for you. And as you always know, next Tuesday, new episode of Drift Garage coming out. Follow the builds as we mm -hmm. progress and uh, get these things buttoned up to try to hit the track. That's right. See you next time.